interesting um, disease processes. I, I don't necessarily enjoy taking care of liver patients, but anytime we have a condition that uh, talks about the liver, I really enjoy talking about it, I really enjoy teaching about it, because the liver plays such a so many vital roles in homeostasis within our body that the when something happens to the liver, it starts to affect so many other um, components of, of our body and, and so many other different processes. So I really like talking about the liver. I really like talking about liver disease. Um, but taking care of a liver patient can be very complicated and very draining and very tiring. So what is cirrhosis? Cirrhosis basically is it's a chronic and irreversible uh, liver disease, okay? And I want you to take note of that, okay? It is irreversible. Um, and what happens here with, with cirrhosis is, is, is our liver starts to become inflamed and we start to get fibrosis of the liver cells. And what this does, it leads to scar tissue within the liver. And this scar tissue causes obstruction of hepatic flow. So we get all the scar tissue and that starts to obstruct uh, normal blood flow within our liver. And this also begins to impede normal liver function. Okay, so once we develop all the scar tissue, once uh, that happens, we start to block this blood flow and we develop all these different scar tissues all over our liver and this starts to impede the normal function of the liver. So interruption of blood flow can cause edema, ascites, esophageal varices, hemorrhoids, varicose veins, um, it can cause decrease in um, coagulation, um, it can cause an alteration in um, blood sugar regulation, it can lead to encephalopathy, and so many other uh, other conditions because of, of what the liver actually does in our body. Okay, so but basically what, you, what I want you to understand about cirrhosis and what it is, is I want you to understand that it, it, what happens is scar tissue develops on the liver and this impedes liver function. And I want you to understand also that it is chronic and it is irreversible, okay? So this would be kind of a close-up of a healthy liver, the different lobes here, and this would be a close-up of a cirrhotic liver. You can see all this scar tissue has developed and clearly with that much scar tissue and that much um, going on with the liver, we're going to have decreased functioning. Okay, so what are some of the assessment findings you're going to find? We talked about some of these, and what I want you to understand as we talk through some of these um, assessment findings, I want you to understand why that's going to happen. Okay, you're going to have malaise, you're going to have general weakness, um, and just a sense of not feeling well. You're going to have jaundice with scleral icterus. Okay, the term icterus means jaundice. Okay. And what happens with jaundice is, is um, the liver starts to be incapable of, of conjugating bilirubin. Okay, bilirubin is a byproduct of hemoglobin breakdown. Okay, and hemoglobin, of course, is in our blood, uh, and bilirubin is the heme breakdown of the heme portion of uh, hem of hemoglobin and that of course is the iron portion okay so what happens is we get this elevated bilirubin and that leads to jaundice uh, and sclerolicterus so sclerolicterus is going to be like yellowing of the eyes okay so anytime you hear the word the term icterus think jaundice we're also going to get edema uh, a reason for that is that um, the liver helps to regulate uh, proteins and protein metabolism Proteins play a, a very important role in, in volume regulation, okay? So proteins help draw fluids in, um, and so when we have a decrease in these proteins, this fluid is going to be able to leak out, and that's going to cause edema. We're also going to notice anorexia with our patients. They're going to have clay-colored stools. They're going to have pain in the right upper quadrant. So R-U-Q here, that of course is where our liver is located, and they're going to have pain right there. Hepatomegaly, splenomegaly, uh, ascites. The best way to test for ascites, and we'll get into this a minute later, is, is here's your navel. Okay, and, and their abdomen is just going to be huge. I mean, they're going to look like a, a lady who has 10 babies in their belly, okay? 
uh, and we're going to see a positive fluid wave test. And, and what we do is we have the patient uh, place their the palm of their hand here, and we hit. Well, we don't hit. We tap over here, and a positive fluid wave test is going to cause vibrations on this side of the navel. So, a positive fluid wave test is going to cause vibrations on this side of the navel. Okay. What it can also cause is hepatic encephalopathy. We'll get into this in a bit as well, but hepatic, hepatic encephalopathy is due to increased ammonia levels. Okay, and ammonia is a byproduct of nitrogen breakdown, um, basically kind of protein breakdown. So it's kind of protein metabolism, nitrogen metabolism. Ammonia is a byproduct of that. Normally the liver gets that out of the system without it getting into the system, but due to um, this blocked blood flow within the liver, ammonia gets into the system. And ammonia is very neurotoxic. So as it gets into the system, it can get into um, cerebral blood flow and it can start to alter um, normal neurological status. It can lead to disorientation, altered levels of consciousness, and fatigue, um, leading patients almost to a comatose sort of state. Another thing we might see in our patients is going to be astrixis. That is a flapping of the hand, and, and you'll just see their hand kind of tapping, like they're almost trying to kind of do Morse code or something. Decrease in reflexes, anemia, and darkened urine. Okay, so those are going to be some of our assessment findings. All right, and, and again, so anytime you think of any sort of condition or disease process, what you have to do first is think about what does this organ or what does this value normally do? What is it normally doing? Okay, and anytime we have uh, a disease process, what that really is is just an alteration in that normal function. So what you're going to see is you're going to see um, the opposite basically of what it would normally do. Okay, so let's talk again about some of these complications, okay? The biggest complications that I want you to know are going to be these four. Uh, portal hypertension, ascites, esophageal varices, uh, hepatorenal syndrome, and, uh, sorry, let's add one more on here, um, and hepatic encephalopathy. Okay, those are the five things I really want you to keep in mind when we're talking about complications of cirrhosis. So the first is going to be portal hypertension. Okay, again, what we talked about here with our liver is what happens is we have our big portal vein. This is a really large vein. Okay, um, massive amount of blood volume flows through here. And what happens when we get all this, uh, when we get the cirrhosis, is we get all this fibrosis um, and, and blood flow becomes impeded through here. So remember, we have a, a huge amount of blood trying to get through here, and because of the cirrhosis, blood is not able to flow through there. So what starts to happen is blood begins to shunt to other paths, other much smaller areas, okay? And so that's gonna be the cause of the portal hypertension. Now again, as I said, blood begins to shunt to other locations. One of the locations it likes to go to is actually the esophagus. Okay, so what happens in our esophagus, so let's say here's our person, there's their tongue, here's the esophagus. What happens here is, is we have all these little tiny veins in our esophagus, and blood begins to shunt away from the liver and goes into the esophagus, these little tiny veins in the esophagus. And what happens is these little varices form, okay? These dilated veins, and incredibly dilated veins in the esophagus. And what'll happen is, if that pressure builds up too much, remember these are very small veins, these are very weak as opposed to your uh, portal vein. So these can actually rupture, okay? Again, remember there's a, a tremendous amount of volume flowing through here. So if one of these esophageal varices rupture, the patient will begin to start spewing blood. And when I say spewing blood, I mean spewing blood, okay? Enormous amounts of blood will begin to come out of the patient. Um, and this is obviously a huge medical emergency. What we have to do is we actually have to kind of put a little, it's almost like when we do like a, uh, we kind of put like a little balloon down here. Okay, so we put this little balloon down here in their esophagus, fill it up, and that pushes pressure back 
on these Pharisees, okay? So here's their esophagus. They have all these varices in here. And so we put this little balloon down here and push pressure back against these varices, trying to prevent the rupturing or to stop the rupturing, okay? So it's, it's, it's very life-threatening bleeding because it's so much volume of blood that's just spewing out of the patient that it becomes very life-threatening. Okay, so obviously our goal is to um, control the bleeding. Again, ascites. So here's ascites in a patient. This, uh, this patient's already somewhat large, but in, in, a, in a skinny patient or a smaller patient, the, the size of the abdomen will, be, will still be the same. It's just huge. It begins to fill with so much fluid. So uh, what, you'll, what you'll do is you'll have them place their palm right here. We'll tap right here, and we'll notice fluid waves going through this side. And that would be positive that there is fluid within there, um, and that would be the ascites. Another thing that can happen is this hepatorenal syndrome, and what happens is the renal begin, or the kidneys begin to fail because of the liver failure. Okay, so we have this uh, obstructed blood flow, we have this portal hypertension, we get this, um, our blood pressure begins to go up and our, our kidneys begin to fail. Okay, lastly let's talk about hepatic encephalopathy again. So what happens is we take in protein, um, and, and protein and, and, and nitrogen begins to be broken down. As that's broken down, one of the byproducts of that is ammonia. Okay, ammonia normally, like I said, within the liver is passed out of the body uh, without ever really getting into the blood system. What happens with um, cirrhosis and liver failure is that that no longer is able to go about the normal way. So ammonia begins to leak into the system. Now unfortunately, ammonia is very neurotoxic. So what happens is as that ammonia goes into the system, our ammonia levels begin to rise and we start to see a decreased level of consciousness. So once the physician can rule out like a stroke or something like that, um, They'll draw possibly ammonia levels, they'll draw liver function le uh, panel, ALT, ALP, all that, AST. Um, they'll be able to determine that there is liver damage. Okay, so once we determine that liver damage, once we see that elevated ammonia, we can determine that possibly the reason for this encephalopathy, which encephalopathy is really just altered neurological status. So the reason for that is probably due to liver failure um, with that ammonia getting into the system. now. Hepatic encephalopathy is generally reversible in most patients, and what we do to get rid of this ammonia is we give what is called lactulose. Okay, lactulose draws ammonia back into the large intestine and then helps it leave um, via the feces. Okay, so therapeutic management. We're gonna keep head of bed elevated. We're gonna do a paracentesis for ascites. What paracentesis is? This is actually thoracentesis right here, but paracentesis will actually go into the abdomen and draw that fluid out. We'll do a fluid restriction, we'll decrease protein intake, remember. Um, we're gonna decrease sodium intake, we're gonna monitor our daily weights, and we're gonna institute bleeding precautions and monitor our coags. Remember, one thing that the liver does is it helps create coagulation factors. So once our, our liver is no longer producing those, our patient becomes a huge bleeding risk. And again, also because of um, these esophageal varices and this portal hypertension, they're even more of a bleeding risk. And so you'll see these liver patients when they're advanced renal or um, liver failure, they're going to be bleeding from uh, every orifice almost. I mean, there's just blood everywhere. Um, a lot of times they'll develop a GI bleed. Um, And that can be really difficult and really hard to manage when there's just blood coming out of their rectum and they cannot stop it, they cannot control it, it's just blood, lower GI bleed, okay? Some of the medications we can give to these patients. Okay, again, think about the conditions that we're trying to prevent. So one of the things we can give is vitamin K. Why are we gonna give vitamin K? Vitamin K can help with coagulation, antacids, um, analgesics for the pain, blood products if needed, diuretics to help get rid of some of the fluid, um, and blood products, again, remember, they're not gonna be developing uh, coags, they're gonna be, and they're a huge risk of bleeding, 
and then lactulose, this will be given every few hours. Um, and the reason for this is decrease ammonia levels and to try to reverse um, encephalopathy. Okay, so those are really kind of the medications we're gonna give for these patients. Um, and like I said, hopefully you can kind of see here how complicated a liver patient really is, an advanced liver failure patient, um, because it really affects almost every system in their body because the liver does so much, okay? Um, so you're gonna be giving coagulation things, you're gonna be monitoring labs, you're gonna be giving diuretics, you're gonna be monitoring output, you're gonna be monitoring um, uh, neurostatus, giving them uh, lactulose often, which is gonna cause them to uh, poop more, and then they're also developing a lower GI bleed, and so they're bleeding. It, it can just become a very, very complex patient, and their neurostatus is declining, so you end up intubating as you're giving the lactulose to protect their airway. It just becomes very, very complicated but it's incredibly interesting and that's really the kind of the basics of um, your cirrhotic patient okay 